Hello there, Sharks. I'm Jonathan Little for PokerCoaching.com, and today we're going to discuss the top three reasons why you are losing at poker. Now, I want to make it very clear. A lot of you are not losers. A lot of you have studied extensively at PokerCoaching.com here with me on YouTube, and you're crushing the games. Good job. Good work. Congrats on that. But if you are struggling at poker and you do not know why, because very often the losing players don't quite know why they are losing and they inevitably blame it on bad luck. Well, it's probably not bad luck. There are very often specific reasons why you are losing. And today we are going to be discussing the top three reasons why people, maybe you, lose at poker. This is not meant to be a criticism of you. This is meant purely to be helpful, educational, enlightening so that you can improve your poker skills and start winning at the game. So, first thing people do wrong is they care way too much about their hand and way too little about their range. Most losing poker players look at their cards and they ask, how do I play my hand? But understand that anytime you make a decision at the poker table, you split your range. For example, say everyone folds to you on the button, okay? If you have a good hand, you raise it. If you have a bad hand, you fold it, right? Some people though, if they have a medium strength hand, they limp with it. Take a second, think about what that does to your limping range. Well, your limping range is going to be all very marginal, right? And if your range is starting off very marginal, you're gonna be really easy to play against if your opponent just applies mindless aggression because unless you improve to top pair or better on the flop, or the turn of the river, you're going to end up folding, right? So you want to make sure that you are playing a balanced range that is difficult to play against. For example, at PokerCoaching.com, we have a tournament masterclass and a cash game masterclass that go in depth and show you the game theory optimal strategy, but also an implementable strategy that will have you playing close enough to the game theory optimal strategy so that you are going to be difficult to play against. For example, in this scenario, Let's say we raise the button with all of these hands that are not white, right? You see all these hands that are white? These are hands that we would fold on the button. Maybe this is a cutoff. I'm not exactly sure of the exact scenario, but it extrapolates to every other scenario. We play with this range pre-flop, and let's say the big blind calls, okay? Flop comes 10, 8, 6. What do we do with our entire range? Not do we play our whole range the same way because we're going to be betting some hands, we're going to be checking some hands, right? But we want to make sure that our betting range has strong hands and weak hands in it. And we also want to be sure that our checking range has strong hands and weak hands in it so that we're not easy to just run over with mindless aggression. What a lot of people do wrong is they check behind with their medium strength hands and garbage only, and then they just fold all of it by the river. If their opponent bets the turn and bet the river, well, that's not going to work out for you at all, right? So you're going to find that in general, when you have what's referred to as a big range advantage, whenever your entire range just crushes your opponent's entire range, which does happen sometimes, in that scenario, you're going to want to bet very, very frequently. But in scenarios where you do not crush your opponent's range, such as on 10-8-6, where the big blind caller in this scenario is going to have a whole lot of straights, two pairs, top pairs, draws, etc., we have to do a decent amount of checking. So in this scenario, take a look at what I would recommend doing. You want to go through and you want to categorize your hands in your range, because we would play all of these hands pre-flop by raising them, right? We're not limping anything. We want to categorize them into premium made hands, draws, marginal made hands, and junk. And then, assuming you don't have a big range advantage, which you do not in this scenario, you're going to bet your premium made hands and your draws, and you're going to check your marginal made hands and your junk. And it's important to realize that your draws are going to be some very good draws, like open-ended straight draws, um, gut shot straight draws with over cards, etc. And some of your draws are going to be pretty weak draws, such as the King Two of Hearts on 10-8-6. You may say, King Two of Hearts isn't a draw. Well, it's a backdoor flush draw, right? You make the king high flush, you're probably going to win. Or if you get a heart on the turn, you can keep betting very easily. And also, if you get a king, you're usually pretty happy. So this counts as a bad draw. This is a draw that you could bet the flop with and then fold if you get raised. Whereas when you have a hand like, let's say, jack nine for a straight draw, you bet this one. And if you get raised, you do not fold because you have lots and lots of equity, right? So when you bet the flop, you're going to have all these good hands in red that are just happy playing a big pot, including sets, top pairs, over pairs, the best middle pairs, pairs with straight draws, etc. right? These are all very good hands. We're not folding if we get raised. And then we're going to bet with some strong draws, such as stuff like Jack-9, Queen-Jack, 
jack seven suited really any any nine or seven is pretty decent if it has an overcard and then we're also going to bet with some weaker draws quote unquote draws such as various overcards like king queen is king queen no back door flush draw a draw eh, sure you get a king or a queen you almost certainly win if you get an ace or a jack or a nine you can continue bluffing maybe even a seven you can keep bluffing so these are cards that are hands that are going to win very often with additional aggression on the turn or the river same thing for these low backdoor flush draws with an overcard then we have this total garbage ace five that's another hand you can bet and then fold to a raise then our checking range this is where a lot of people go very wrong what a lot of people do incorrectly here is they bet every 10 8 6 or pair and that makes their checking range something like ace high and worse so imagine your checking range on this flop is ace high and worse well unless you get an ace on the turn if your opponent bets you just lose right and the tough thing is that if your opponent is trying to check it down they probably have an eight or a six and you're going to lose anyway so if they bet you end up folding and you lose if they check it down they have a pair and you lose so you're going to lose if you use this strategy which is not ideal you do not want to take a large chunk of your range here all these aces and just lose with them that would be quite bad so you want to make sure that you put some hands in your checking range that you know you're not going to fold to a turn bet unless the board is really bad for you so we have some eights in our range right we have some pairs I would definitely recommend even protecting this. Maybe you check back the aces sometimes, right? I think that would be very viable. You want to do everything you can to reasonably protect your checking range. But notice we have a lot of sixes that we're not folding to a turn bet. We have a lot of eights we're not folding to a turn bet. We have some ace nine and ace seven we're not folding. Ace king and ace queen, we're probably not going to fold to a turn bet unless the turn's quite bad. And realize a lot of these hands in green are going to improve to a pair on various turns, right? Like if a king comes, ace king, king six improves to a pair. If like, let's say a... Uh, Queen comes, ace queen improves to a pair, queen eight improves to a pair, queen six, right? So on various turns, you're gonna improve to the best hand, and your opponent's gonna have a difficult time seeing that. So that's how you go about playing these scenarios. You also check back your total garbage. That's gonna be stuff like jack five, no backdoor flush draw, fine and reasonable. But at pokercoaching.com, we discuss extensively how to balance out these ratios over here. These ratios over here are gonna let you know if you're playing somewhat in balance or not. As a general rule on the flop, you can have at most two draws to every one premium made hand. Fewer is fine. Notice here it's more like a 1.4 to 1 ratio or something like that, which is fine. Um, but you don't want to have a ton of draws because then your range is way too weak, right? These, these ratios here will inform you if you're playing a reasonable strategy or not. If you have like all premium made hands and no draws, that's a problem too because when you bet, you just have the nuts. Your opponents can easily fold, right? You may say, but my opponents are calling stations. They're oblivious. Good, then you found a nice, easy game that you can just sit there and value bet your opponents to death. I'm presuming your opponents are not horribly awful at poker because if they're horribly awful at poker, well, you're just going to win. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to lose if your opponents are blundering left and right. Unless, of course, you are blundering left and right. A lot of people in the small stakes games get a little bit egotistical and think they know how to crush their opponents because their opponents play so bad and they, in turn try to adjust so much to the point that they end up playing very poorly themselves and they lose. So you're going to find that starting off with a good fundamentally sound strategy and then adjusting accordingly is very often the way to go about beating basically every game. All right, next reason you're probably losing is game selection. You are probably playing in games that are too tough for you. People very often play as high as they possibly can to the point of failure. But you're going to find the biggest winners in the game play a level or two below what they conceivably could play, right? You have to understand, if you're the ninth best poker player in the world, you're really, really good. But if you sit at the table with players number one to eight, you are going to be a consistent loser. You need to understand where your win rate comes from and game select accordingly. For example, there are some $10,000 buy-in tournaments that are quite soft. They satellite in a lot of players from $100 buy-in games, right? If $100 players are playing in $10,000 tournaments, they're presumably going to be less skilled than the regular $10,000 players, right? But there are also some $10,000 tournaments that satellite in no players, and those games are very tough. If you care about making sure you have an edge, you want to play in the games that are soft and not the games that are tough, because in the games that are tough, even if you're good, your win rate may be 5 or 10% return on investment. But in the really soft ones, you may have 50% return on investment. Would you rather have 50% return on investment or five? It's up to you. You have to be disciplined and make sure you're playing in games that you can beat. Same thing happens when you're playing in cash games, right? Whenever you walk into a casino, let's say you want to play one three no limit and they have four one three no limit games. Very often, one of those games is not particularly profitable to play at, even for a good player, because first off, the rake is going to be kind of high in a lot of one three games, which is a big problem. Make sure you're playing in games with low rake, if at all possible. But also, 
Sometimes, some players in specific games are going to be taking the game very seriously. And they're going to be trying their absolute best to win. Whereas at the other tables, they may be having a party. I remember one time I went to a casino in Philadelphia to play 5-10 no limit randomly for a day. I walk in there and there are two 5-10 games. One of the games had everyone wearing sunglasses, hoodies, drinking their green tea and water. The other table, everyone was having a party. It was like a circus over there. They were all having fine wine, throwing chips in the pot, etc. Right? Well, I can guarantee you at the tough game, your win rate is going to be minimal. At the party table, your win rate is going to be through the roof. And you know what happened? They seated me at the tough table initially. Fine. What you do is you ask the floor person to put you on the table change list. And as soon as the seat comes open at the other table, you have first priority to take it, which of course you will in that scenario, right? So make sure that you ensure that you have the best chance of success by getting in games and specifically seats that you can win at, right? Also, in No Limit Hold'em, Pot Limit Omaha, any game with position, chips flow to the left, okay? Meaning, you're going to lose money to the people on your left, on average. And you're going to win money from the people on your right, on average. So, you want big stacks on your right and short stacks on your left. If you can ever set that up. Sometimes you can. In cash games, you can move seats if you feel inclined. So, if you have a big stack on your right and small stacks on your left, you're going to win big pots and lose small pots. You ideally want to have position on the weakest players, right? Who are going to be making errors because you're going to be the one in position to capitalize. So you want to make sure that you're not just going to the casino and taking a seat or just going to the casino and playing whatever the daily tournament is. You want to make sure that you're being selective about it and playing in games where you have the biggest edge possible. Third thing, third reason why you are probably losing at poker is that you are far too emotional about short-term variance. Poker is a high-variance game, and if you're trying to view this game as a get-rich-quick scheme, you're not going to make it. hate to break it to you. While every year, someone turns a little bit of money into a whole lot of money by running hot, parlaying it, and parlaying it, and parlaying it, and getting rich, you may not know this, but a lot of them end up broke because they continue being, I'm not going to say degenerate, but uh, yeah, I will. They, they continue being degenerates. You have to realize that if you consistently play with a small bankroll and you're taking gigantic shots, especially in tough games as the games, as the buy-ins get higher and higher, your edge is going to diminish down to nothing. So then you really are just kind of flipping a coin to some extent, maybe even with a minimal edge. But if you don't have a proper bankroll, you're going to get demolished. Also, a lot of people, especially in the live poker arena, do not actually play all that much poker. You're not actually putting in a lot of volume. You have to understand that volume cures variance. And you have to work hard and play a lot to actually realize your edge. I think a lot of people get it in their minds because of, um, you know, media and Twitter and whatnot. They see people winning. World Series of Poker is happening right now. And I, when I look at my Twitter feed, this person won a bracelet. This person won a bracelet. This person won a bracelet. You're like, man, everybody's winning a bracelet. Why aren't I? Well, there's a whole lot of people not winning the bracelets, right? You only see the winners to some extent. And you have to make sure that you have a clear picture of reality. I mean, this is why I put out video blogs that are 100% open and honest, showing quite often I go and I play a tournament series, I didn't win any hands, and I lost. It happens. Sometimes I win too. But you're not going to always just go there and smash your opponents. You have to realize that, and you have to be reasonable about that. You have to understand how variance actually is in poker. And there is a lot of variance. But if you play a lot with an edge, it's basically impossible to lose in the long run. A lot of people think the long run, though, is like a year. But then you dig deeper into their results and or into their data, and they're like, they play one tournament every week. It's 52 tournaments. I hate to break it to you. 52 tournaments is not a lot of tournaments. And you're going to experience a whole lot of variance over 52 tournaments. So realize that the long run is perhaps quite longer than you think it is. What happens to a lot of people is they go and they play, let's say, one tournament a week, and they lose for three months straight. No caches. 12 games. Hate to break it to you. You're going to go 12 games without getting a cash frequently if you play a lot of poker tournaments. Or if you're playing cash games, you may go for a stretch where you lose some number of sessions in a row, especially if you play short sessions because you're not putting in very much volume, right? And this makes some people go on tilt. And this is when... They go off the deep end. They don't play their best. They show up. They're already annoyed. They're already mad. But you have to realize, when you're not playing your best, whatever edge you have when you are playing your best usually goes right into the dumpster. And then you start playing at a big negative, well, at a, at a big disadvantage, right? And if you're playing at a big disadvantage over and over again, well, now your opponent's going to be beating you. 
which is going to make, it's not even necessarily your variance go up, but you're going to go down into the dumpster farther and farther and farther. I want you to get out of the dumpster, everyone. And playing poorly, playing when you're on tilt, is just going to result in your results being awful. Because, like, even if you're a good, strong winning player, you're going to experience variance, right? And sometimes that's going to result in you losing. If you're a losing player, instead of trickling up on average, you're going to be trickling down on average. So then whenever you actually do get a bad run, it's going to go way down, right? And um, that makes a lot of people sad, depressed, annoyed, and I do not want that for you. You do not want to be sad, depressed, or annoyed in life. Fully recognize that you have a great opportunity to play poker, and that if you get to play poker, you're, uh, you're doing pretty well in life, even if it may not necessarily feel like it. This is a game that's supposed to be fun and enjoyable, and if you are not having fun, if you're not enjoying it, you need to figure out how to do that. And uh, at least for me, an easy way to do that is to win. And if you play when you're on tilt, you're way less likely to win. So don't get on tilt in the first place. Understand that variance exists. Embrace it. Accept it. Play with a big bankroll. Play a lot of volume, and you'll find that that will cure variance in the long run. You just have to realize that this is a long-run game, not a get-rich-quick scheme. So that's it. Those are the top three reasons why you are losing at poker. If you enjoyed this video, do me a quick favor. Click the like and subscribe buttons below. Also, if there are any other reasons why you think your peers are losing at poker, or maybe you're losing at poker that you want me to discuss, let me know in the comment section. I read every single comment that comes through. I appreciate them, and I appreciate you being here watching this video. Good luck in your games. Have a great, great day, and I'll talk to you next time. How would you like to have one of these championship bracelets from winning a major poker tournament? Well, here, I have plenty. I'll give you one of these. Oh. Couldn't quite get it to you. Instead, you're going to have to win your own. To get started, click the subscribe button.